People say that Python is slow. I have said that Python is slow. But now would be an appropriate time to attempt to render 100,000 Steves in Python since I just hit 100,000 subscribers and Python is kind of my whole thing. If you work professionally in software, you'll find that a lot of companies use Python as code glue. It's incredible for expressing logical ideas succinctly and truly shines when the heavy lifting is done through optimized dependencies, usually written in other languages. Believe it or not, games are no different. Game logic outside of rendering is oftentimes not computationally expensive, so if I can run my 100,000 Steves and shaders on the GPU and minimize the computational steps required in Python, 100,000 Steves are theoretically perfectly achievable. The truth is, Python is slow, but it doesn't really matter nearly as much as people think it does as long as you're resourceful. I'll attempt to render them in my multiplayer VR shooter since I already have a running pipeline that's well suited for this type of task. Let's take a quick look at the math of the problem. Rendering a frame requires the scene to be rendered four times. Once for each eye, since it's VR, and twice in order to generate all the real-time dynamic shadows. Multiplying that by the 100,000 Steves and the 72 FPS the Quest 3 natively supports gives us over 28 million render calls per second if each Steve is an object that requires computation from Python. With a simple script, we can see that such a feat is in fact impossible with that technique in Python since it can't even add that amount of numbers in under a second. It wouldn't even be a good approach even if you were using something faster like C++. I said my game was well suited for this task earlier. How you may ask? Well look at this tree, and all that grass. I previously had performance issues with computing all the transforms for the grass in Python until I changed up my technique. Instead of individually performing render calls in Python for each tree and piece of grass, I combined all the objects into one, and embedded the origin of each original object into its vertex data so that the shaders can know which object the tree or grass originates from even while it's merged. With this technique, I can have somewhat independently behaving objects with a single Python render call. Step 1 is to place everything in the world from the steves to the land underneath their feet. I'll hijack the map loading of the main game map I have so far and use a double for loop with a base size of 316 by 317 and a padding of 2 on the x-axis and 1 on the z-axis so I can surround the steves with trees on 3 sides. I'll add grass blocks to the world at each location for the ground with a bit of an offset so that it's off to the side from the base map. Now we can filter the locations to exclude the edges and filter again for the first 10 rows for quick testing before adding steve decor objects to the world. Add decor adds objects to the optimized decor system I described earlier. It works with any object type. Let's go ahead and randomize the base size and scale as well. For other locations, let's place some trees using the same system so it surrounds all the steves. Now let's take a quick look at the game and see how this all turned out. I gotta climb up this tower to see them since they're over the south wall. Wow, that's a lot of steves. And that's only 3,000 of them. Goes from there all the way over there. Uh, and I'll fill out this whole area with Steve's to hit 100,000. Although they would look better with a bit of movement. Now it's time for the fun part, where I make the Steve's jump around and look all excited. Decor groups can have unique shaders applied to them, so I have a base shader used for the Steve's here. In this case, this is a vertex shader. So rather than shading pixels as you would normally think of shaders, it's computing all the transforms that should be applied to each vertex, or you may think of them as points, of the models. If we look at our inputs here, we get the specific vertex we're transforming and, if you remember from earlier, the origin from the original object before it was combined, plus the time which we'll use later. The vertex we're provided with is the location of the vertex after it's been combined with the millions of vertices from the other Steves. So a good first step is to calculate the position of the vertex with respect to the original Steve this vertex belongs to. A secondary bit of information that we'll need is a seed value. Each Steve should have a unique behavior, so I've written a function that converts its origin into a pseudo-random value between 0 and 1. To make the Steves look alive, I want them to jump and turn. We'll have to figure out a mathematical formula to describe these values in terms of the input time, since there isn't any memory we can write to for each Steve object inside the shader. Consider for a moment the sine wave. It goes up and down in a pretty smooth pattern. 
Let's clamp the bottom so it can never be negative, and consider the output as our jump height and the input as time. Doesn't that look like a jump to you? We can define the jump height as the clamp value of the sine wave of the time, with the seed baked into both the phase shift and the frequency of the wave for unique behavior. The angle can just be an unclamped sine wave with the same technique but different constants so that they're not aligned. The output we're looking for from a vertex shader is the position of the vertex, so we need to apply these values to our local position and generate a world position. We can get our local rotated position by simply converting to a four-dimensional vertex and applying a rotation matrix around the y-axis with the generated angle. I'm using a rotation matrix generation function I found on Google since it's fairly standard and I didn't feel like reinventing the wheel here. Finally, we can apply the jump offset by just modifying the y value of the vertex. To get the world position again for the output, we just add the origin back in since we removed it when we computed the local position. For the final step, we can apply the view transform, which is effectively what places the object from the perspective of the view, which could be the eyes in the case of VR, and assign it as the output vertex. With that, we're pretty much done. I've just got to remove the 10 row limit in the generation so that the world will now have all 100,000 Steves. And there we have it. I've achieved my goal of rendering a Steve for each subscriber in a Python VR game in real time. Wow. This is my first time seeing all the Steves. That is a lot. But that is, in fact, 100,000. Wow. Here they all are. As you may have come to expect from this channel, there's a lot more you can do with Python than most people expect. Just use your resources wisely. Thanks for watching.